Whitney, thank you for welcoming us to Chicago. It's good to be in your town. <clears throat> All right, we're going to start in 27 seconds, everybody. How about those young poets last night? Wasn't that phenomenal? Woo! So I prepared a little something myself. For, no, totally. You do not want to hear me rhyme, and especially before, let's say, 11 a.m. Pacific time, so you know where I'm at. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm Steve Patrick. For those of you who I haven't met, I can't wait to meet you. Uh, a lot of you are old friends and family, and it's good to be amongst you again here in Chicago. Let's give it up for Chicago. Uh, in, in all my work with folks in Chicago, I've learned that, you know, you don't really do the shy town thing and all that. You just, you know, like, it's Chicago. Uh, or though last night I heard a new, uh, what was the, what was the? Chicago. Chicago. Um, so it's great to be here. We know this is an interesting time in the front lines of creating opportunity and overcoming barriers and and clearly, um, Chicago is on those front lines right now. Uh, and we're all sort of in the same struggle. And it is just important to acknowledge that this is a moment, um, sometimes of despair. Uh, but then you get in a room like this, and it's a moment for hope uh, and for opportunity. And so I, I think it's going to be an incredible. How were the site visits yesterday? Everybody have a good time? Everybody learned something? Yeah. Uh, I just heard lots of good stuff. It's, a, it's an Im important moment in, in this town's uh, uh, you know, struggle uh, and an important moment in the struggle that so many of you guys are doing every day. So I think for me, the, the most important frame is the one that we've always started with, with the Opportunity Youth Incentive Fund, which is you know, the fierce urgency of now we've got to do something today around pathways, around access to opportunity, around connecting young people who never had a first chance to a second chance. But we also have to carry that bigger frame of the systems change, systems alignment work uh, that takes time. Uh, and that, you know, if not us who in the community, who's going to break down the barriers between the different systems and structures. And that, that's uh, an important thread. And I just wanted to uh, reintroduce it to our conversation right out of the box. But I was supposed to come up here and say nothing and introduce Melody. So, um, so uh, sorry about that. Um, uh, it's great to be with you guys. It's also great to be with our chair again, who is, you know, a phenomenal leader, uh, you know, walks the talk, uh, leads by following, steps out in front and leads when she needs to. Um, and has a level of integrity that uh, somebody like me can only aspire to reach. And so uh, it's really a privilege to introduce Melody, who's going to kick off the morning uh, and get us started. Actually, Mel, let me just say thank you to the Aspen team and staff who put this thing together. And yeah. You guys have done it again. Um, so a perfect example of the integrity that I aspire to reach uh, that Melody has achieved. I almost forgot to thank our team. But Melody would not do that. Melody Barnes, chair of the Aspen Forum, everybody. <laughs> I've never had music before. Wow, OK. <laughs> um, well, first of all, thank you, Steve. And it is, as Steve said, it is so wonderful to be here with all of you. And as I mentioned it last night, I, w I really do wish you could be here to see you as, the, as I do. Um, and the greetings in the halls and the hugs, because this has happened over time as we've done our work in our own communities, but we've also come together to learn from one another, to um, take inspiration from one another, and in particularly the young people and the young leaders who are in the room with us as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Um, and I want to thank Steve and thank the Aspen team as well for all the hard work that goes into making this possible and excited about the time that we're going to spend together over the next couple of hours. 
Uh, we're going to start out this morning with a really, really wonderful set of panels. But before we do, I do want to echo what Steve was saying and just how important and timely we believe it is to be here in Chicago right now. We know that those of you who are living here and working here wake up every day with the knowledge of young people who literally were here yesterday and are, are not here today. Um, and those, as those numbers rise and the nation hears about those numbers, we know that you are here on the ground and that you're doing the work. <clears throat> we also know that what we hear about in terms of homicide is really a reflection of what we know is happening in terms of hopelessness for so many young people and for so many families that are here. And that there is a direct relationship between those two things and also an inverse relationship between those feelings and the, not only the perception but the reality of opportunity for young people here. And while that feels bleak and is bleak, we also know this. One, as Steve said, that this isn't just a challenge that's taking place in Chicago. And we know what the numbers look like in Chicago. We know what the reality is. But that's how, these are the challenges that we're facing in all of our communities all over the country. The other thing that we know, and this is the thing that I know gives me hope, particularly when I look out at all of you, is that even with all the work that has to be done, the truth is that we are here because we are doing that work. And again, thank you for committing your lives to that every single day. It is making a difference, and it will make a difference. And I think the time that we spend here over the next couple of days and digging into our work, sharing what we've learned, sharing the challenges, sharing the places where we've tripped and we've fallen, but also the places where we've gotten up and we've moved forward, will help us go back home and go back to our communities and to be stronger in doing that. So the panels that we're about to have are going to kick us off and help us begin that exploration I think in such a significant way. They are an extraordinary group of people. We're gonna start out, and we've used this format before, so hope you liked it then. Um, we are gonna start out with a panel of system leaders who are going to talk about their experiences here in Chicago, and specifically what they're doing and what they believe has moved us forward in Chicago. And from there, we're going to have a panel of leaders from various organizations in Chicago across different sectors to reflect on what they've just heard, but also talk about what they are doing that's contributing to sustainable change. After, after that point, we're going to give you all a chance at your tables to talk about that from your own experiences, to share with one another, and give you a chunk of time to do that, about 20 minutes to do that, and then we'll come back and engage as a whole across the room and have a chance for conversation. So that's the way we're going to spend the next hour and a half-ish um, with one another and look forward to that and look forward, as I say, to the next couple of days and to see where we are at the end and then as we prepare to go back home. So with that, I want to bring to the stage the first panel that we have. And as I said, we are very, very, very excited um, about this group. So as I call your name, if you will come up on the stage, um, maybe you'll get music too. Um, but first we have Dr. Janice Jackson, who is the Chief Education Officer for Chicago Public Schools. And we also have Lisa Morrison Butler, who's the Commissioner for the Department of Family Support Services. Lisa. Then um, my friend from uh, days back in Washington, uh, Sandra Abravea, who's the President and Chief Impact Officer with Thrive Chicago. <laughs> and then finally, Karen Norrington-Reeves, who's the CEO of the Cook Workforce Partnership, someone we've had the opportunity to hear from before. Good to have you back. Oh, okay. Okay, I didn't get the where 
handsome him up. <laughs> <laughs> Am I? Yeah, no, good. <laughs> I know, I know. Every woman in the room knows exactly what that means. It's like the, the balancing act you're doing wearing a dress sitting up in a place like this. Um, but thank you all. It's so great to have you, with, have you with us this morning. And as I said, the first thing I want to start out with and have each, each of you be able to respond to this question we thought we'd start out by talking about the accomplishments. And accomplishments can happen, and we talked about this a little bit on our calls, can happen at every place on the spectrum, um, whether you are at the very beginning of the process or further down the road. But we want to hear from you about the system change accomplishment that you want us to hear about and to reflect on, and why you see it as a system level accomplishment and how you got there something for all of us to be able to take back home. So Should we I start? start? Yes, please. Good morning. Um, uh, my name is Janice Jackson. I'm Chief Ed Officer for Chicago Public Schools. Um, first, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to participate on this panel and also giving us a forum to talk about the great work that we're doing in Chicago. Anytime I have that opportunity, I see it as a blessing because I consider the great work that we do, that the educators do every day, almost a counter narrative to what you hear about mm -hmm. Chicago Public Schools. And I think that the theme of this event also speaks to that. I like the positive framing around opportunity youth and not at-risk youth and some of the other terms that we often hear mm -hmm. about some of our students who, who face a lot of challenges and quite frankly, challenges that I don't know that many of us will be able to overcome. But today, I could, I could talk about a lot of initiatives that we've um, implemented in CPS that I think support students who face a lot of challenges. But the one that we're most proud of today and I think is most fitting for this event is to talk about our SOAR centers. And I understand that some of you had an opportunity to visit um, yesterday. Currently, we have four SOAR centers throughout Chicago, and since their inception, we've served about 3,000 students um, and re-engaged students who had otherwise decided that school was not the right place for them. Um, what's great about the SOAR Center is that um, it takes into consideration a few things. First of all, it takes into consideration that second chances matter. Many of our students need second, third, and fourth chances because, you know, they face a lot of challenges, as I stated earlier. But they also look at the whole child because it's not just about school. It's not just about the academics or um, those types of things that uh, are, you know, make students disengage from school. There are so many other factors, family issues, financial issues, psychological issues. And the specialists at the SOAR centers do a really great job of working with children, helping them re-engage, and then helping them find the next space, whether that is returning to a public school, a traditional public school, or returning to one of our, our alternative schools. So, You've probably heard CPS um, talk about the increase in graduation rates, the increase in freshmen on track, and I would say that that increase is directly correlated with the success of the SOAR centers. If we were not re-engaging more youth and bringing them back into our school system, we would not be able to celebrate that accomplishment. If you look, Chicago public, I mean, Chicago is outpacing many other large urban school districts in improving graduation rates, and I think that's because we have a, a, a focus that goes across the continuum. We're we're looking at our students who come in ready and prepared for high school, but we're also looking for students who have academic and social emotional issues that prevent them from being successful. So if I had to highlight one thing, it would be the SOAR centers. I'm really excited about the re-engagement strategies that we use, but more importantly, the success. If students don't leave with a high school diploma, it's really hard to sell them on the next step. It's really hard to sell them on that American dream. Great, thank you, thank you. Lisa? My name is Lisa Morrison Butler, and I get to be the commissioner for the Department of Family and Support Services. Um, it's about seven and a half months on the job. Who's counting? Um, <laughs> so I don't want to be Debbie Downer to, uh, to Janice's comments, and uh, it's important to say that I don't feel discouraged. But I come into this position with a background, um, having led a nonprofit for many years, and so I still have that nonprofit mission-driven heart. And so I will tell you that um, from our standpoint at the Department of Family and Support Services, we are focused on the gaps that we see right now. Um, and um, definitely my boss, the mayor, is focused on those gaps. And so one of the things that we're involved in right now that I'm pretty excited about is, and this is gonna sound really simplistic compared to, for instance, Janice is sharing about a successful program. We're trying to drive everyone in Chicago to one table 
to have a conversation about what's going on with Opportunity Youth. One of the things we know is despite the considerable resources that the city has to play with, there are so many of these young adults that are disconnected that if we don't pool our resources, if we can't see across lines to see what other people are doing, that we will not be able to be successful. So the mayor is really, really interested in us trying to force folks to come to one table so that we can have one conversation. As an example, last Thursday, I was in three meetings in one day on Opportunity Youth, um, three different perspectives. Uh, some of the folks were the same in certain meetings. Uh, it's amazing how many different presentation decks, but all the presentation decks show the same thing. Inglewood, Inglewood is the number one um, neighborhood that struggles with this. And so uh, the truth of the matter is it was a waste of time to have three meetings last Thursday on this thing. Um, and so one deck, one story, uh, one conversation is how we will actually start to move this thing forward. Well, let me, let me ask this question. <laughs> and people are clapping for, I think, a reason. How many of you have had that same experience, literally? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, Lisa, how are you all going about trying to build that one table? Um, it's, a, it's an interesting process. Um, obviously, the mayor's office and you know his focus on this gives us a really significant bully pulpit, if you will. But we also have some amazing research partners in this town. We've got amazing funders in this town. We've got high net worth individuals in this town. And so a lot of that is, is like, it's like herding cats. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that we are doing right now is just being very, very forceful about it to be true. We're trying to make sure that everyone understands who else is playing in the space. Um, we, there isn't a meeting that I'm in that I don't try to bring this up and say these are the people that were in the last meeting that aren't here right now that should be. Um, and um, it's kind of interesting. I, I appreciate the passions that make people want to get involved. I really do. Um, and it's not like I'm unusual in this, but I feel um, I feel very connected. This is my community that we're mm -hmm. talking about, and so I don't really have patience for egos. I don't want to waste time because there's one person or one funder that would like to take credit for progress. So we're just being very, very um, adamant mm -hmm. that there is sort of a, a coalescing around a central conversation with all of the folks that you see here and, and many of you are already a part of that, and those that aren't, we need to, we need to get a bigger table. Mm -hmm. Great. Sandra. Hi, I'm Sandra Abravai. I'm with Thrive Chicago, and my job, I think, is just to support these leaders here in doing their work. And um, so many of the community organizations and foundations that are excited and um, passionate about this space, but I think to Lisa's uh, point, um, bringing them into one conversation. Um, Thrive is a collective impact organization, so for those that aren't familiar, what we're doing is trying to drive alignment and coordination um, and maximizing the impact we have when we, we work together. So in particular in the opportunity use space, that's an important task at hand for us. Um, but very concretely over the course of the last year, what we've done in particular with CPS is support the work um, that Janice's team has been doing with the SOAR centers. And um, I think this will be a nice illustration of how a collective impact organization can, can help and support. So you essentially have students dropping out of CPS and then they get connected to all of these incredible nonprofits in Chicago um, that are trying to support them and help them get them back on their feet. But those nonprofits aren't always then immediately connected to the SOAR centers. So over the course of the last year, what Thrive has done is bring together this enormous community of nonprofits that are serving these kids and touching these kids once they drop out and saying, hey, 
Are you aware of this resource? The source centers can help reconnect these young people to school. And so sometimes the biggest challenge we face is just strengthening the connective tissue between what the nonprofits are doing and each of the agencies are doing so that there aren't drop-offs, so that we really strengthen the handoff. So we've helped CPS um, meet their recruitment targets with the source center youth. And then this coming year, something really exciting that we're doing is the source centers hold on to these kids and provide supports for 45 days. And what they find is that of the kids that start in um, the schools that they get reconnected with, essentially 80% of them make it 45 days. But then of that original cohort, only 60% graduate, right, and so, or finish actually the first year rather, I'm sorry, and what we're trying to do now is say, hey, that CBO community that is already engaged with these youth, why don't you provide wraparound supports so that once the SOAR centers stop supporting them, the community at large can support them. So these are just like a couple of really concrete examples of how we're all doing really important work, but sometimes what's um, really helpful is to strengthen the connective tissue between where the nonprofits stop and where an agency picks up a kid or, or vice versa. And, and certainly we're very excited and I um, want to just congratulate this whole panel and many of you in the room for um, acting, as Steve said, with a fierce urgency of now. We are, these agencies and many of the nonprofits in Chicago are holding a hiring fair for Opportunity Youth on May 12th, and we have 20 companies committed to hiring this population, and the workforce agency is in the lead, um, and it is in North Lawndale, a very difficult um, you know, community with many opportunity youth in need, and so those are the sorts of things that I think we're, we're working on. And just before we go to, to Karen, you talked about strengthening the connective tissue. How are you going about doing that? I mean, just getting under the hood a little bit more with that. Yeah, I mean, so the way that Thrive as a Collective Impact Organization mm -hmm. functions is we bring people together in monthly convenings, and so our table is an open invitation. We say from the very small grassroots nonprofits in the communities to the big foundations that are funding the work to the city agencies, let's come and sit together and really wrestle with this problem. Let's look at the data. Let's ask ourselves a series of why questions to really identify root causes. And then let's come up with collective strategies to address the problem. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, we'll dig down a little on some of these a little bit later, because this is, I think, is, this is the meaty work. This is the meaty information that's helpful to all of us. Karen. Good morning, everyone. I'm Karen Norrington-Reeves. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership. And so for those of you who aren't familiar, the partnership oversees local workforce development, employment training, and administration of federal and philanthropic dollars. Uh, we serve an opportunity youth population. We have um, annually, with the federal allotment that we have, we can serve about 4,200 or so. We have been, we started as a nonprofit for the primary purpose of ensuring that we could access philanthropic and corporate dollars to help augment the federal funding and be able to serve in a deeper and broader way. So we have added in probably another thousand young people that we're able to serve because of the, mm -hmm. the other dollars and then through some of the initiatives that we're doing. Um, so for example with Thrive Chicago, the 100,000 opportunities, we are now a demonstration city and so we're going to be able to service folks in some non-traditional ways doing direct employment and professional development. I would say as a system, the thing that I'm probably most proud of with respect to Opportunity Youth are the significant changes that we made. Uh, when we first launched, I would say in that first year, uh, 2012 to 2013, our numbers were really dismal in terms of performance outcomes. So we were in uh, the sort of low 40th percentile. Now the bar is set low when you're negotiating amongst the, the federal agencies and state agencies around your performance metrics. So the, the, the bar was really like 52%, you know, would either um, persist in pursuing secondary, uh, post-secondary mm -hmm. education or, um, or go on for job placement. Mm -hmm. And I'm really happy to say that we were very diligent about the provision of technical assistance. We were very, very diligent about ensuring that we had the right agencies within our network. So we have currently 53 workforce development organizations that we subgrant to. 32 of those are youth-facing organizations. Well, when we first started, most of them were failing. And within that first year, we were able to put 
some metrics in place. So think about it. If you were at work and not performing well, you would be put on a performance improvement plan. Like this was all not rocket science, right? Mm -hmm. And so we created a performance improvement plan and we literally, we call them IPPs instead of PIPs, but we literally put agencies on improvement plans. We gave them a quarter to get it together, whether it was an operational issue, a back of the house, a front of the house issue. Um, we gave them some intensive supports. We outlined very clearly, here are the challenges and we expect this, this outcome. And eight of the agencies either closed altogether or were terminated. So I am very happy to say that for this program year, we are at 78%, right? I mean, that, that is just a dramatic, yeah. significant improvement. Uh, we've got 74% of our young people are going on to post-secondary mm. education or, or some sort of credential attainment, and 78% job placement rate, which is just such a huge turnaround. Mm -hmm. So when I look at what are we doing with respect to opportunity youth and, and where are the challenges, the biggest thing for me is I wish we were doing, uh, we had greater capacity uh, to scale that mm -hmm. because I know that we've got communities in Chicago where... You know, it says, oh, there's only 20% unemployment rate here. But when you layer in ethnicity, when you layer in age, when you layer in gender, we're at 60% mm -hmm. in some communities mm -hmm. for black male mm -hmm. unemployment mm -hmm. and 40 and 50% for Hispanic male unemployment. That's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of the work that we've done, but I know that there's a lot more to be done. Well, and you, what you just said is actually a perfect segue into the question I wanted to ask next. And this, you may have just given your answer, so if you can dive into it a little bit more, that would be great. I was going to ask each of you, given the accomplishments that you just described, what's missing? What is it that you isn't, that isn't happening that you think is so critical and you really wish, if I could wave that wand and make X happen, it would be... And is it, is it the scaling piece of it, or is it something else? So I, I actually, you know, we talked about this in preparation for the panel, and I actually just sat and kind of reflected on this last night. It's, it's, it's a both and, not an either or, right? Mm -hmm. So it's scale and integration. Mm -hmm. So, and I think Lisa touched on this a bit. So the scale is certainly missing because... Um, we're in a unique position in that we are responsible for delivering services both in the city of Chicago and Cook County. And so we, we hear a lot about what's going on in the city, but the south suburbs are just decimated. Uh, so scale, if we could have more funding to be able to reach more people, then you know, that would be, for me, one of the missing links. But the other piece is around integration, and it's ensuring that we're not having these siloed, isolated conversations mm -hmm. and not having siloed, isolated efforts that are impacting this little sliver, or whether that be geographic or, or um, you know, demographically. Um, we've got to make sure that there is this woven tapestry mm -hmm. of services that are available that meet people wherever the heck they are. Mm -hmm. um, and to be at all of these different tables, just like Lisa was saying, you, there are a lot of people who, who are bringing energy and money mm -hmm. and, and um, intellectual capacity to the table, but we gotta have everybody together working in sync. Like the bicycle doesn't move you forward <laughs> unless the pedals and the gears and, and you know, the little chain around there, everything is linked together, mm -hmm. right? It's all got to be working in unison and in harmony. And I see a lot of siloed efforts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there will be tables, I mean, this is ridiculous, but, you know, there was this convening around um, violence and, you know, anti-violence efforts, and there's a workforce committee. We weren't even invited to the table. We oversee $60 million worth of employment mm. training funds. What sense does that make, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's the kind of stuff that happens and right. happens regularly. I would say it's happening less and less. We're connected to Thrive. We're partnering with DFSS. We have monthly meetings with leadership at CPS. Um, we even had been working on a pilot to 
um, shift the SOAR centers that now exclusively focus on education, but to add in that workforce development piece. Two of the SOAR centers are co-located with two of our top mm. youth agencies. So it just makes sense, right? But when, you, when that happens and you call someone and you say, hey, Hello. $60 million, what's up? I mean, what do people, do people go, oh, I didn't know? Or do, or do they say, oh, I didn't know? And well, you're like, yeah, you could, knew. I mean, if what's, I could what's jump happening? In, one of the things that happens is it's interesting. It's, it's not always, now don't get me wrong, this is a big city. So sometimes mm -hmm. maybe it's purposeful. But sometimes it's just the sheer scope mm -hmm. and size of the city. Mm -hmm. So we are asking the nonprofit and government sector to do something that, oh, by the way, if it was easy, the corporate sector would have done a long time ago. Nobody asked General Motors to sit with its competitors. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. We're talking about bring everybody in the room, develop some trust, lay your, lay your model out. Tell me how you do what you do. Tell me what you measure. By the way, how do you raise your money? How, you know, uh, what's your impact? And then we need to see all of that so that we can then line up the people that are at risk and negotiate the handoffs. Okay, so, but here's so the problem. Some of, yeah. it, some, of it is, some of it is politics, but a lot of it is the complexity and the logistics of what we're trying to do. It needs to be a big table because you're literally talking about at DFSS alone, uh, there's hundreds of delegate agencies that we fund. Um, you've got your own that. list. Of, I mean, this is a big market. So trying to figure out how to have that conversation and then the right way to move it forward is no small feat. Can I would say the no, one challenge, though, Lisa, that mm -hmm. I would pick up on is the fact that people perceive themselves as competitors. That, right. That's the one thing. What irritates the heck out of me about that is that I am not going to fight with you over yep. poor and disenfranchised people. That makes no sense. At the end of the day, we all need to see each other. You know, part Here's the image that I, I like to leave folks with. We all think that if I get, then you don't get, right? Zero and, sum game. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and what we have to do, I think, as leaders is shift the paradigm to one of, we are all standing at Lake Michigan, right? We are side by side on the beach. We each have a bucket. We dip our bucket into the water. My bucket's full, your bucket's full, your bucket's full, because there are enough young people to go around. The question becomes, how do we effectively get the people who are in control of the dollars to the table to see how to equitably distribute the dollars in order to have the most impact? And I want to come to Janice and to Sandra. There's clearly a lot to discuss here. Yeah. <laughs> but I want to come to Janice and Sandra and get your perception of what's missing. Well, I think a lot of it was covered. I heard the theme of coordination <laughs> and you know bringing mm -hmm. everyone to the table. I guess the other piece that I'd like to highlight is just awareness. So we mm -hmm. talked about awareness maybe amongst the adults and people who are delivering services. But I think more awareness amongst the students and families who actually need these supports. So I think that. Um, if we could start by working with the, the local high schools and, and social service agencies so that they know that there are, there are places for students to go if they struggle. I think that while we're excited about re-engaging thousands of students, there are far too many who don't have that opportunity. So if we could use social media and other outlets to reach the youth to make sure that they understand that there are options if they've made a decision to drop out of school, I think that would be, if I could wave a magic wand, everybody mm -hmm. would know what opportunities exist and they would know how to access mm -hmm. them. Great. Sandra? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm just doing my darndest to um, <laughs> help support a collaborative, strategic table on this issue that is inclusive. And uh, I am trying to pull every lever I know of, and it is challenging. And so what's missing? What is missing? <laughs> Um, what, what would you want to have? I think that could? what is missing is a truly inclusive, collaborative conversation that is one table. I okay. think that is missing. And um, we are all working together over time to make that happen. Mm -hmm. But um, there are a lot of different ways that things get done in this city, right? And so uh, they don't always get done through a truly community led, you know, worker bee movement and that kind of movement takes time to coordinate it's messy you know it takes listening to a lot of voices and sometimes people are impatient and they don't like that 
process, um, but I think, we, I think we need it if we're gonna solve this in a sustainable way. Great. Well, so this just gives you a taste with our first fantastic panel. Um, and please help me thank them, and then we're going to bring up our reflection panel. They'll be back. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I think for, for the just. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, so now we're going to, as I mentioned before, bring up our next panel that will help us reflect on what we just heard. So I would like you to join me in welcoming to the stage um, Julius Robinson, who is from Youth Guidance Becoming a Ma'am. Bam, thank you. <laughs> Brian Samuels, who's Executive Director Chapin Hall and the University of Chicago. <laughs> Mike Stratmanis from the Obama Foundation. Mike is a former colleague of mine. <laughs> Strat. Um, and Whitney Smith from the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation. Great. Thank you, thank you. So the first question, I just want you to share with all of us as you listen to the last panel and the things that they they talked about, both in terms of achievement, things like the SOAR Center and bringing together a collective impact table, working to, to create one table, as well as the challenges, what's missing, what they would like to, to see done next. Give us, give us your reflections on that. All right, I just want to piggyback on what she, well, I remember someone was saying about um, expanding the programs. Mm -hmm. I, think you I think you should expand the programs for the simple fact that there's a lot of students out here that doesn't have that support system. There's a lot of students out here that I know for simple, simple fact that it's only BAM, my program that I was in for about like six years since elementary school that helped me get to be the person I am today. I remember that it was there was like charter schools and a lot of elementary school and charter schools don't have this program. I think y'all should expand it for the simple fact. I know that it, if it could change me, it could change anybody else in the community. So I think you should just expand the program so you can help other students that don't have these programs they, so they can experience, and I believe it will reduce violence in the community. So, and Julius, I just want to follow up on that for a second. One of the things that was said on the last panel, not only expansion and opportunity, but knowledge, awareness of those opportunities. How did you become aware of BAM? And do you think your peers, others that you have encountered, are, are aware of, of the opportunities that are available to them. What would be the best way of trying to connect people to those opportunities? Uh, I believe, well, I got introduced to BAM by, um, by my principal because I had bad grades. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, I needed that type of help to help me get my grades back up to where it was supposed to be. So my principal introduced me to BAM, and it had did help me for my elementary school years of getting my grades back up, being that type of kid to, you know, that everybody want to look up at and also that it helped me in my high school years too for the simple fact it helped me visionary goal setting as in how like, you know, like I did not believe I accomplished my goals for the simple fact I want to meet the president, I want to be at the White House. And the simple fact that I did get to meet the president three times, I did get to go to the White House <laughs> and was invited to be a part of the youth panel of, um, the, of the White House. I had, you know, they helped me accomplish my goals and helped me motivate that I, I can achieve other things in life. It's just not, if you work hard for it, if you take the right pathways and the open doors that give, get you there, you can accomplish your goals. So, Great. Yeah. Great, thanks. We'll talk more about that too in a second. Whitney, your, your reflections based on what you yeah, just Yeah, let me just pick up on this for a second and then I'll give my reflections and say at the coffee hour this morning, I met a group from Detroit who had done the site visit to BAM yesterday and said, we, we wanna bring BAM to Detroit. So you're an inspiration to all of us, thank you. Um, I, I just want to start by saying I appreciated how real that panel was uh, this morning about how hard this work is and how hard it is to coordinate. Uh, and, and we have great leadership and great work going on. I'll just draw out two lessons that I think 
I heard that might be instructive for the other collective impact efforts. One is I do think we are getting better at using data in the city. Uh, I think it was the commissioner who mentioned Englewood, which is a community where we know there are a high number of opportunity youth who are uh, you know, involved in juvenile justice, et cetera. We've gotten better at figuring out among opportunity youth um, different needs and different community uh, uh, services that are needed based on where the opportunity youth be, are, lies so, or lives. So uh, more work to do there, but I think we're getting more sophisticated. The second thing I would just say is that um, our this is a community of collective impact practitioners, and Thrive is our collective impact effort in the city. And when we first started a couple years ago, we decided not to create a specific change network around Opportunity Youth because so many of the issues that we were focused on in the different change networks touched on the population. And that was the right decision at the time. But now I think for a variety of reasons, uh, because of uh, new funding, because of new focus on this population, we really do need a dedicated table. So now I think Thrive is really well positioned to create that table specifically around opportunity youth. And so the lesson I just wanna draw out is that as we create the collective impact efforts around the, uh, in, in our communities, that those really need to adapt with the times, that if you've created a structure around specific projects and the needs change, don't be scared to go back to the collective impact table and say, wait a minute, for the next couple years, we really need to focus on this. And I think that's where we are in Chicago. We need that dedicated table to bring all of these opportunity youth uh, efforts together. Great, thank you. Mike. Hello. You're, hello. <laughs> I'm going to hold my, I'm gonna, already going to learn from the young people. I'm going to hold my mic like <laughs> my man here. Um, so uh, I think a couple reflections come out for me um, on, the, on, on the panel. I think one, you know, the uh, president is fond of uh, repeating this phrase, do your job. <laughs> and, um, and it has a specific meaning right now as he uh, talks about the Supreme Court. But it is also a... Um, <laughs> It comes from, I think, a, a belief that he has that in a, in a democracy, in order to make change, um, we, we need all, uh, everybody needs to participate. And one of the uh, areas that I think is so uh, critical here in Chicago, and one of the reasons why I know we're excited to be here in Chicago, is that citizen voice, that, that, that collective voice, that ground up participation, is just a critical element. Um, to change and to impact and to, and to success. And I think that sometimes we can, um, who, uh, folks who want to make a difference in these areas, sometimes want to try to um, substitute for that mm -hmm. um, and, and create a, another means uh, of hearing from the community rather than just hearing from the community. Um, Melody, we, we did get a chance to work together uh, in the White House and, and I think Either it's because of the, what you had when you brought in there, which is why the president wanted you there, or what you came uh, uh, out of there with, that you would have a young person actually participate in the discussion. That is incredibly rare, uh, to actually have the voice of the people that you are looking to impact there uh, with an equal chair at that table. Um, as Sandra said, another one of our alums, it is messy. It is complicated, and sometimes people want to skip that step, but I think, it, I think it, it's critical, um, and, and I know the president would say that, uh, and he says it constantly these days, that citizen participation, civic participation, um, is, is one of the biggest factors in making an impact on the issues that we uh, care so much about. Um, and I guess the other reflection that I have is I think leaders make a difference. Mm -hmm. Um, I was incredibly motivated and impressed by uh, the group of leaders that are here. You know, we, um, I got uh, back to Chicago about a month, two months ago. And, uh, and so, you know, we're all sort of just coming back, just getting started, starting to listen, starting to build as we try to um, create a strategy around uh, where the president and the first lady are going to go next. Um, and, and, you know, there are just incredible strong leaders that are here, and I think it's one of the assets that we have. Um, but yet developing 
nurturing and supporting uh, leaders in, in, in all the sectors and all the neighborhoods and all the communities on all the blocks and all the neighborhoods, I think is going to be also critically important if we're going to make a difference. But I think one of the reasons why we're poised to make the progress that you reflected on um, is that we have these amazing leaders um, like the ones that were up here uh, before us, and uh, it's got me very excited. Okay. Brian. Um, great. Um, so when I, when I listened um, to the, the group that was here, the panel that was here, you know, one of the things that I was struck by is the, the importance of understanding um, the, t the target population, right? That the understanding that not all programs work equally well for all youth, right? And so a part of the discussion up here was about how do we better align our resources to the particular needs of the opportunity youth rather than having a generic strategy that might attempt to meet the needs of all youth, um, but in the end, probably falls short of meeting the needs of opportunity youth. And so I think that there is a really important distinction in this movement um, that is about understanding the population in a way um, that we fully embrace both the challenges as well as the assets that they bring with them. Uh, and it begs a question, right, uh, for, the, for this audience which is for this population, um, uh, as a group that cares about this population, is our goal to advocate for more resources or is our goal um, to advocate for better or different resources, right? Is it that this population just needs more of the same stuff that's already available or do they need something separate and distinct, right? And it's grappling with how much of our work is about just getting to more versus how much of our work um, is about getting to better. Um, and it's really the struggle, mm -hmm. it's really that struggle um, that, that you heard being talked about up here um, as leaders to try to overcome the inertia uh, of bureaucracies often uh, in order to better align their resources so that the goal is about getting to better. So, um, I just, again, I posit for you the question of really is your work about being and doing more or is it about doing different and better? And if so, what does that mean for your work? That's a really, that's a fantastic question. I'm wondering, Brian, as you do your work, what you are seeing uh, and how you would help people go about answering and responding to that question. Sure, so um, uh, I run a research center um, at the University of Chicago um, and um, we do applied research and we have partners um, across the country uh, working um, around issues of opportunity use. So I would just note um, four examples of that work uh, and why I think it helps to move um, the ball forward. Um, one of the pieces of work we do um, is around um, homeless youth uh, and with a small number of foundations we have partnered with um, to create an initiative that is a national initiative that attempts to develop a method for better identifying, identifying counting and serving um, homeless youth. So it's a 22 um, community um, initiative across the country. Chicago is one of those. Uh, and part of what we're trying to do there is to dig deeper to better understand this population of young people, their life experience, um, but also be able in those 22 communities to turn back around and say, so what is it that we're doing that's probably working and what are we doing that's probably not working? And putting forward ideas that are really about um, serving the population better. Um, we're also doing work here uh, in Chicago around the juvenile detention center uh, and, a, and around creating a more comprehensive strategy of looking at screening um, and assessment and treatment to make sure that there's alignment across those services so that a youth that comes into the court doesn't get assessed by one agency and then when they get placed in detention they get assessed by another agency and when they're uh, put on, uh, on probation um, they're getting assessed by another agency and get served. So trying to create a comprehensive strategy that's based on understanding where these young people come from. So I think that that's part of the solution. Uh, two other things I would point out that add um, to that um, is we're doing this work uh, uh, with the City Department of Public Health, really trying to use Medicaid data um, and claims data to specifically look at where's the supply of mental health services for young people uh, and where's the demand. 
Uh, right, And so that work is not necessarily about defining the population, it's about getting the services closer to the young people who need the services to most. And I think that's also a critical component um, of getting better. And then the last example um, that I would use is we're doing work in child welfare. Um, and a specific piece of work that we're doing in child welfare looks at the group of young people that are served by congregate living or treatment, um, uh, residential treatment. Uh, and what we're trying to do is to try to better understand what's the community-based infrastructure that has to be in place so that young people don't get forced to live in congregate living settings that don't really meet anybody's needs uh, and put them in a situation where they're actually accessing services um, in, through their foster home or with a home of a relative. And in that space, it's about finding what the better alternative is and helping public agencies take those better alternatives and create a process that actually scales up um, alternative treatment strategies so that young people are not in restrictive environments, but instead are in the least restrictive environment and benefit most by staying in the community uh, and staying in a family setting. Right, I mean, there's so much more to talk about here over, and hope we'll do it over the next couple of days because better always seems like the logical answer, right? I mean, you always wanna be better, but getting to better is often very difficult. It involves a lot of change, and it means sometimes not doing something that's been done before, and there are people and commitments and all kinds of things attached um, to those old ways. So there's, there's lots to be discussed there. Thank you. Julie, so I want to come back to you to talk a little bit more about, about BAM. I mean, I know a lot of us in the room went there yesterday, but more, many of us were not able to. And tell us how for you and given the work that you do there, you see BAM as contributing to the solution to help create more opportunity for, for you and your peers. All right, so yeah, like I said, um, I've been at BAM for seven years and like BAM did help me for the simple fact, like I said, I did have bad grades and it helped me during my high school transition. And like I know somebody said earlier about um, emotional, mm -hmm. with some of dealing with emotionals, like, Mentor, this mentor program lets you literally sit down with a couple of guys just like you, as the same person like you. And you'll be surprised like how many young men can sit in a circle and tell about their feelings, and you will see that you're not the only one alone. So that's what like helped us like to get more deep on the emotional level. And like BAM helped me when I had a friend that passed away junior year. It did like the emotionals built up inside me and then had me affected where I wanted to drop out of school and I wanted to like be a nobody and stuff like that. But then, you know, my teachers had got worried about me, so they knew I was in band program, so they talked to my mentors and told them, like, what was going down and what was happening to me. And being my mentors, like, I've been on my mentors since, like, almost my life, so they, like, another family to me. And, like, a lot of people do need that second family for the simple fact a lot of young men out here do not have fathers. I do have a father, but the simple fact me and my father did not have a good relationship. Anyway, I did live with him. It's just a simple fact we used to always bump hands and stuff. So I always had that safe haven to go to, you know, to talk about my feelings and how I felt about, you know, what was going through my life. And that did help me for the simple fact that got me back on, back on, um, con you know, contract, back on moving forward also. So that, like, helped me doing that. And also, it helped me, like, get my first job. Like, in my career, I wanted to do TV production assistant. I wanted to deal with cameras. I wanted to do stuff like that. It helped me connect with other people, in, like, in the city of Chicago. Not just in Chicago. When I went to the White House, I connected with other leaders just like y'all. I connected with them, too, and they helped me get my first job as a TV production assistant for Can TV. So I took, so it helped me, bam, like put a lot of, you know, open doors for me. I believe like right now, I believe like if it wasn't for Bam, I probably wouldn't be the man I am today for the simple fact it helped me respect the women, you know, how to respect them right, how the visionary goal set in. Like at first I remember I ain't want to go to college at all. I remember I was like, oh, I'm gonna be this type of kid to graduate and make this money fast, you know, like forget college. But the simple fact my mentors really sat down and talked to me and told me like, and I knew from the fact that I grew around, I'm on the south side of Chicago, I grew around a lot of violence, a lot of fighting, a lot of killing. And I knew, like, I need to get out of town. Like, I need to do something with my life. And BAM helped me every step of the way. So, like, like when I said about college, I did not want to go to college. BAM sat down and told me, like, what do you want to do in life? What do you want to be in life? What you trying to do? What's your goals? And I literally sat down and talked to them about my goals. And like, as I said, they opened doors for me. So every time I put on a resume or something, I put BAM. And they're like, oh, yeah, I know about that program. I know 
how you liked it, and they asked me about that. So, bam, we're the fake for the simple fact. Fake young men's lives for the simple fact because they have a safe haven to go to. They have somebody to talk to. They have that father figure. And also, we consider each other as family for the simple fact. Like, is we, if we all connected together, we see, like, oh, we're not different. We consider each other students as brothers. We call each other brothers as we get into the program for the simple fact that we are brothers. We are made the same way. So the BAM program do help us in so many ways. And how many other BAM brothers do you have? How many well, are in the program? I, really, all of us in the Chicago Public Schools is considered as brothers. Like, if we do not meet, like, say first time we meet each other, you will think we family. Like, because in fact, we connect with each other. Like, we all is in the same program. We all consider each other as brothers. So the emotional support, the connection between your teachers and schools to those in the program, career, goal setting, and identification. I love the phrase you used when you talked about, um, I think it was your uh, visionary goals that you were setting, setting for yourself and all of that's happening and hoping and wanting that for so many other young men across Chicago. Yeah, and also I want to put out that it do help young men in Chicago for the simple fact that I, um, I have people that look up to me now. like. I have people that see what I'm doing, like in the neighborhoods, like they see me, like I did commercials, like I did, they see me when I went to the White House, like they literally come up to me and tell me, and I feel good about it when they tell me, like I look up to you, like I, use, I see you doing something with your life and not being in these streets or where it's dangerous, like you're really doing something with your life. So I appreciate like how Ben helped me become a better leader, it's not to be a follower. All right, yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and Whitney, and now with, we, we, many of us in this room know you from a couple of, of different lives, but now um, with J.P. Morgan Chase, this is foundation, and tell us how the foundation is focusing on creating a sustainable set of pathways for young people, like Julius and others. Yeah. I, and if I can, I mean, actually, I'm wearing kind of two hats, which is I, I lead our philanthropic, give, philanthropic giving for the Midwest, in, including Chicago, but I also represent the company. So uh, let me actually start with what we're doing as a firm, and then I'll say something about the foundation. Um, like many kind of big corporate citizens, J.P. Morgan Chase has made a commitment to a number of youth development and youth leadership programs, kind of as... Um, to provide internships and our employees serve as mentors. You know, we have partnerships with Year Up and Christo Ray and, and other organizations in town. Uh, and that really is driven out of kind of a broader mission of it's important to provide people opportunities and exposure, uh, and, and we are very committed to that. But I think the conversation in, has also turned to a uh, deep conversation about how we we hire in terms of entry level employment at the firm. We, along with many financial service firms in town, have been engaged in a conversation in recent months to look at how we source talent and um, looking at, uh, frankly, untraditional sources for how we typically find our folks. We're looking at potential partnerships with community colleges, whereas we used to hire uh, for entry-level positions that we'd say you require a four-year degree when really maybe you don't need a four-year degree with a, a two-year degree with some work experience, you'd be very viable for a pathway job. So uh, this work is, um, these conversations are underway and, and we're happy to be participating in them and I hope in a year's time I can report out some of the changes we've made as a firm. On the philanthropic side, and Melody is an advisor to the firm, so she could probably do, you know, talk about this as, as um, well as, as I can. Uh, we have made a huge commitment to workforce readiness. We launched an initiative uh, two years ago called New Skills at Work, which is a $250 million commitment uh, to build pathways for individuals to get to middle skill jobs I think most people in this room know what that term means, but just, just in case not, jobs that you know, pay considerably higher than a, the minimum wage. In Chicago, we would say $25 an hour. Um, and, and don't, again, require a full bachelor's degree, but with some certification um, or perhaps an associate's degree, you can get on a path. And every year in Chicago, there are 30,000 of these jobs nearly that open up. And the question is, how do you get 
uh, how do you create a citywide system of pathways to lead to those uh, to those jobs? And uh, you know, there are a number of good programs, but similar to what we've been talking about, specific to opportunity youth, those programs are not in a clear system. So we're working in a number of industries with a number of partners to create clearer and better pathways for people to commit, get to middle school jobs. Um, as I was reflecting on this meeting, I think uh, there is a very good question about all the nonprofits and systems that serve opportunity youth. How are we making sure you're connecting to the pathway programs? Um, and, that, and many of them provide intensive supports in addition to the actual skills training. And I don't think we have that down. I think that's something I'm going to be thinking about as a new philanthropic leader with the firm about how to make those connections uh, more specifically. And I'll sit at that table that's being created, hopefully, in Chicago. Um, so I'll, I'll just stop there, but we, we have uh, a number of great investments in town that I, if I had more time, I would love to highlight. Great. Strat, I know you've been literally here for two months <laughs> since um, about, well, December, January. So, and the foundation is just getting up and running. So I guess the question is, how do you all envision that you will be able to move forward and to help contribute solutions to the kind of work that we've been talking about here? Sure. Well, um, you know, the, the president's work has always been about bringing people together um, to take on uh, our greatest challenges. And so, uh, you know, we know that this next chapter will be no different. Um, we're, you know, the, the, we are just beginning. The president and first lady are, are pretty busy at the current job. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so uh, I think I it would envision uh, two things that I want to just let this crowd, uh, all of you who are doing incredible work, know about. The first is that um, we uh, uh, believe and hope and, and are planning to open uh, the Obama Presidential Center on the south side of Chicago um, in 2021. When the, when the world comes, and the world will come. What, what, are, what are they going to see? What will, what will they see here in Chicago um, uh, at that point? Um, you know, I think today, uh, if you look hard, you can see a lot of hope. You can see a lot of opportunity. Uh, but I think you'll also see the kind of balkanized, fractured, siloed um, work being done and communities that um, have been left behind and underinvested in for decades. Uh, and I think uh, what we really hope to do is be in a position to work with you so that the, the community looks different, the city looks different, uh, and we really can take that moment to celebrate uh, all of us uh, around Chicago having come together uh, to, pr to be ready for that, for that global spotlight um, so that we can come back to a panel like this um, and talk about the successes or we can all be invited across the country and really across the world, um, or maybe we could just do it at the center, uh, uh, and, and talk about um, Chicago as a model for impact um, and change around uh, this population of young people. Uh, and then I think for, for us, we um, are really gonna be spending a lot of time listening. As I look around the room, I've, I've been in several of your offices already, uh, and I intend to be in, in all of them. Uh, listening and trying to really figure out where's the place in which having this president and first lady, the president will be 55 when he leaves office, the first lady will be younger. We want to get into the numbers here. Good answer. Um, thank you. I don't want, you know, I like my job, yeah. I want to keep my job. Um, but, you know, how can we uh, use their energy and their focus uh, again, on community solutions, on bringing people together, and on the city where the first lady grew up, um, in the neighborhood in which she was born, and in the, and in the uh, area where the president first began his public career. How, how can we use uh, what they've learned, what they can do, their incredible talent, um, in order to make an impact and a difference in this area as a value add, um, uh, and not as something that is, is trying to replace or supplant or duplicate something that's already going well. So that, that's the kind of conversation we look forward to having with you uh, over the months to come. Great. Well, I'd like you to, one, help me thank this panel. Um, but before you do, just to give you a sense of where we will go next, uh, now there's some time for you all, having heard these two panels, 
given all the work that you're doing back home, to spend some time at your tables reflecting on what you've just heard. You know, what questions you might have, how you think this applies to the work that you're doing, um, how it resonates with you. And then we'll come back probably in about 15 minutes um, and we'll have an engaged whole room conversation with you having an opportunity to do some Q&A with uh, the panelists. So thanks to this panel. And please talk amongst yourselves. Thank you. <laughs>